to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Numbers. Numbers chapter 21. A lot of things are going to be going on this month. For those of you, we're going to be uh, have an opportunity to press in a little bit more spiritually. I like what David said in that many times we just do the minimum. And that's the way it is in, in life, particularly among, I would say, it's not just an American thing. It's a human thing. Uh, humans are that way. No matter what country you're from, we just seem to, to have an idea or culture. We just get by with just the minimum. Uh, it's the way it is with sons and daughters. Uh, husbands, wives, grandmas, grandpas, sometimes we just work that way. But I like doing the maximum because you only got so much time here. You only have so much time. So uh, in saying that, I started up on Wednesday night with a thought on the wilderness. And, um, and I talked how the children of Israel left Egypt. You already know this. Slavery has been around since the beginning. And every culture probably at one time or another has been in slavery. And because of that, you had the children of Israel slavery for 400 years. And they left Egypt. And we always have called Egypt the land of not enough. In life, before you get born again, you are in the land of not enough. There's, there's not enough grace to make it through the day. There's not enough, amen, a, a mercy. There's not enough love. There's not enough peace. There's not enough joy. And then when they left there, they started going through Sinai, which is the land of just enough. And I will say this to you. Just enough grace, just enough mercy, just enough love, just enough peace can just enough get you by a day. Amen. But what we all want is to get to the land of more than enough. Can I get an amen? How many like to get to the land where you're paid off? All your bills are paid off. Your vehicles are paid off. Your medical bills are paid off. The, the children are taken care of. I mean, that's the land. That's really what we're all about. It's not heaven. Heaven is not the promised land. The promised land is a place of giants. But it is a land of more than enough. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and life more abundantly. That you would get. And this is a place we press for. Can I get an amen? I'm pressing for that. I'm, pre I'm moving toward it. And there are things that can rack that and change that. Uh, your, again, your health can change that. A flood can change that. What a joy to be paid off as churches, both of our churches, and then get hit by the flood and still realize after all the digging out we've done, we're still paid off. Can I get an amen? So we're walking into that place, but I want to tell you, in life, you're either in the wilderness or you're coming out of the wilderness. And just enough is not enough. You want to move through it. You want to keep on going. You want to keep on pressing. So in the midweek, I touched on this, but I want to add a little bit more to it. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down because I'm going to repeat this over the next few Sundays and maybe even the midweek because I want you to catch it. 2019, we should be more prayerful. Amen. We should pray more. Amen. Each year as we move on in life, there should be more opportunities to pray. When, you, when you're connecting, uh, I don't care if you're driving, today I'll, uh, in a couple hours, one of my great joys will be I'll get on my Harley and I'll get to ride with a bunch of brothers and sisters and that to me will be a time of prayer. If you've ever rode with anybody in our church, you will be praying. Is that right, Kenny? For as long as I've been riding, for, for 30 years, I mean, I, I pray when I'm on my scooter. Prayerful is proper balance of dependence issue. Remember, without God, there's no life. So you've got to connect to the life source. If you get disconnected from him, you're in trouble. The children of Israel, Israel had to learn this lesson. Second thing is relational. Proper social integration. Introduce yourself to your family. Amen. And this is your family. Welcome to church. This is your family. When you're in this house, you're, you're, in, you're with your family now. Now, you say, well, no, I just went to church on Sunday. No, no, no. This is my brother. We've been together a long time. We've done a lot of things together. We used to golf every, at least once a week. We don't do that no more. Now we're just old. But he's still my brother. Amen. This is my family. I, I want you to join hands with somebody next to you. I want you to say to them, look at them and say it, I am an original. When I'm gone, there won't be another one like me. So you better learn to love me. Amen. 
Amen. You're sitting with a bunch of originals in here. There's, everybody in here is original. So you've got to learn to connect with them and understand how important relationship is. Even the children you created are all originals. Next is sacrificial, the proper use of our resources. Remember, you only have so many resources in life. Now, you can put them in storage buildings if you want where the rats are going to eat them up, but you can learn to use them, sell them, whatever you can do. But everybody has a limited amount of resources. Learn how to use your resources properly. Always learn to be a tither learn how to give unto god that which is his understand it's a biblical principle old testament new testament i don't care how you divide it It, it's it's all over scripture that we give of our time our talent our treasures and our tithe amen so learn to be and if if for you many folk it's not a sacrifice it's not a sacrifice to give of a tithe of 10 percent but for some it is Learn to live sacrificially. Understand it's, it's okay to stretch yourself. In the wilderness, they had to do that, but they also learned that God provided. This morning as I walked out of the house, I even told it to my pastor uh, 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 I was, I was traveling here, and I said to him, I said, when I walked out of the house, I said, Lord, help me convey your word to your people. Help me share your word, because that's my job in this life is to preach the word to your people. But don't let me ever think that my dependence depends on them. That, in other words, you don't pay my salary. Amen. I don't exist because you're here. I exist because he's here. You exist not because I'm here. You exist because he's here. Amen. And that's important for us to understand. And then get into a place of influence. Uh, I'm sorry, worshipful. For, uh, next one here. Worship. The proper focus on controlling all things. That I stay. That I understand my worship is unto him. Amen. I, you only worship that which is God. Can I get an amen? I told you about this last week. I'm going to walk into, I'm going to walk Jesus back to the Old Testament for you again in just a minute. And then influential, the proper use of our influence. Yeah, everybody here has influence. You've got influence, hopefully, on your children, your animals, that which is around you, on your job, at school. Everybody has influence. Learn how to use your influence. Learn how to use it. When I'm at a wedding, I know that I'm there for a reason. I'm, I'm the MC. I'm the influencer. I'm going to influence this thing. I'm going to shift it. And, and, and it always happened. Both brides yesterday were so nervous that it wasn't going to go perfect. Are you kidding? Look who your pastor is. Of course it's not going to be perfect. But once the wedding starts, it is what it is. If the kids burp and throw up or whatever happens, it, it's, it is what it is. You, and it's going to be fine. And it was both times. Learn, learn how to use your influence. Know, know that God gave you influence. Now, you found Numbers 21? Are you comfortable? If you haven't found Numbers 21, you're not going to. <laughs> numbers 21, let me back. I'll give you a little preface here in the beginning. Uh, Moses, his big sister Miriam, has passed away. This is after the time he has struck the rock and got mad at the people. Of course, we talked about last week that rock was Christ. That's why you couldn't strike the rock. I mean, don't strike that. He was going to be struck during the time of the cross. Uh, And then we have this. The Scripture says they traveled from Mount Or along the route to the Red Sea. Actually, one Scripture says they went along beside the Red Sea to go around from Edom. But the people grew impatient. The word there, impatient, in the Hebrew is discouraged on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no, there's no bread. There's no water. And we detest this miserable food. Do you pick up on that? There ain't no bread, and we detest what we're eating. Scratch your head just a minute. You just said there was no bread, but now you detest what you're eating. Amen. In other words, you're getting something to eat. It's called manna. Amen. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. There are times that God's sense of humor is is very short. Sent snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned. We messed up. We missed the mark when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake, put it on a pole. Anyone who was bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake, put it up on a pole. And when anyone was bitten by the snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. They looked and lived. The amazing part of this is when you go over into the New Testament in the book of John chapter 3, 
verse 14 says, Just as Moses was lifted up, the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. You can almost say everybody that looks toward him will live. So Jesus was found here again in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers that he was the snake on the pole lifted up. Of course, when he was on the cross lifted up, you look to him and you'll live. When I read this, I'm fascinated how, how they, they run in parallel. But what hit me is that people were on their way. Everybody's on the way. Where are you going? Well, I'm on my way. Where, well, where is that? Well, everybody's on their way to the kingdom of God. We understand that. But God has a wilderness for you. He has a wilderness for me. And why does God put us in the wilderness? I'm going to give you the great, great answer here. Because he loves you. What? Because he loves you. He put you in the wilderness. He brought them out of somewhere and didn't just put them straight over into the promised land. He brought them through somewhere to develop their character, to develop their patience, to develop their love for one another. He did it because he loves them. It's not the wilderness that is important, but rather our response to it. One of my favorite shows, and I've mentioned this on Wednesday night, is a show called Forced in Fire. And they will take a, a, a piece of metal, and they will forge that metal, and they will beat that metal. They will heat that metal, H, and they'll put it down in some oil. And I see, I see God all in this show. The beatings you've taken, the, the betrayals you've been through, the hurts you've had, the offenses, they beat you, they beat you, they beat you. And all of a sudden, now you're becoming an instrument for God, and you want to scream, enough is enough. And he puts you back in the fire, and he molds you a little bit more, Jack, and then he yanks you out, and he beats you some more, and then he puts you in the anointing, the oil, and then it hardens you up. Now, it didn't just harden you to make you, it make your heart harden. It made you useful. Yeah. Then they'll take that knife, and they'll make this statement. They're going to take it and they're going to hit it on some bone, some metal, some wood, and they will say, it's not what the knife does to the metal, the bone, the wood, or the object. It's what the object does to the knife. And it amazes me in the wilderness, it's not what you've done in the wilderness, it's what the wilderness has done to you. How it's molded you, how it's made you, and how you're ready for it. And you can say, like, like when David mentioned this morning, you can go on with the minimum if you want to, but every one of them knives I've seen that were minimum, they broke, they shattered, they spurred, they rolled, they weren't able to handle it. But everyone that handled the fortune, that went through the fire, that handled all Joshua and Caleb, my goodness, I'm preaching for I got ready for it. Amen. They, they, everybody that went through that thing, they came out on the other side strong. They were able to handle whatever the wilderness threw at them. Why does God do that? Because he loves you. He loves you. He knows what this life. And I don't know yet, but what we do here may matter there. That how you've made friends here, how you've connected with people here, how you forgave people here will matter when we get there. What if God has something planned on the other side that every little thing, it's a, all the tapestry that's been weaved through life here is going to matter when you get there. Your, your character, your integrity, your love, your peace, your joy, all these little things, all, even the bad decisions when you said, God, forgive me, wash it away, and he washed it away, and he prepares you for what's ahead. Mm, I'm excited. John the Baptist came through the wilderness. When they found John, he was eating grasshoppers, wearing a coat made from camel hair, sticking his hand. When's the last time you robbed a honeycomb? Probably had little whips all over his face. From being stung, come out preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Amen. There's one coming after me. His shoes I ain't even worthy to touch. He's my cousin Jesus. We're not even talking about cuz. He's Jesus, and he's talking like this. He come out of the wilderness. I've said this for years. I don't know where this man of God got that camel outfit. But in my mind, he had a camel named Clyde, and he rode him till he died. And then he skinned him, and he put him on. He was the original wild child, John the Baptist. And when he came out of the wilderness, it started a revival. Jesus put Jesus into, God put Jesus, it will work it that way, into the wilderness. My friend, it launched his ministry. The children of Israel were just people till they went through the wilderness. Then they became a nation. Who knows what you are yet till you get through it? Father, I love you. Bless the people. Let us understand we in it, coming out of it. Either way, God, you're changing us. You're forging us. You're, you're working us in Jesus' name. And everyone said?
Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm going to move rather quickly here. I'm going to repeat a few things that I shared with no, I have no problem repeating myself. You already know that. The older I get, the more I repeat myself. I didn't tell uh, you this last week. I'll tell it to you now because uh, it's kind of funny. Y'all know J. Bo Johnson. Jay's been in both services, been with me 20 years. Jay and I were sitting together the other night, and he asked me, he said, uh, have you seen the movie Clint Eastwood is in called The Mule? Now, I ain't telling you to go see it. I'm just telling you that I'm interested in movies with old men like that. And, and I like Clint Eastwood. So he said, have you, see, he said it, have you seen him? I said, oh, I said, what a movie. I said, that movie's son. I said, it's hilarious. That old man ain't got a filter. He's not politically correct, Charlie. He's going to say things that's going to be offensive. If you're young, you can't get away with it. When you're old, you've been forged a little bit. You can say stuff like that. And Jay said, oh, yeah, I like that. And we were talking about parts in the movie. And then he said to me, he said, do you, you know, Toby Keith wrote that song, Don't Let the Old Man In. Because Eastwood told him at a golf, they were playing golf, Eastwood told him, he said, man, when Toby said, how are you able at 88 to keep doing what you're doing? He says, every time I walk outside, I remind myself, don't let the old man in. Because if he comes in, he's going to break me down. He's going to make me lazy. He's going to make me stay. He said, so don't let the, so Toby Keith wrote, I said, yeah, that song's at the end of the movie. Yeah, they sang that song, don't let the old man in. And then Jay stopped, and, he, and there's a silence in my house. He looks at me, and he said, Pastor, we saw that movie together. I said, oh, yeah, we did. It was last week. <laughs> now, now, yeah, I remember now. You ain't got to say anything to Jay because it's bad on me too because I forgot I was with him when he saw it. And we were That's what it's going to be like as you get older. You just, you know, life just gets better. You can hide your own Easter eggs. Hello. <laughs> Everybody say you got to learn it. As you go through the wilderness, there's things you got to learn. Watch this. First, they, they learned these things all they were there if they were paying attention. They, first, they learned of God's power. The Egyptians, how God took care of them with the ten plagues of peer pressure. The, 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 all the things that took place. And listen to me. When it was going on in Egypt, it wasn't going on with them. When, when darkness hit Egypt, it wasn't in Goshen where they were. The little place where, they, where the children of Israel were staying. When, when the frogs hit, when the, all, all the different plagues hit, they, so they saw God's power very quickly. They learned to obey God. They followed the cloud. Listen, when the cloud, Exodus 13 tells us that that cloud would come out and during the, the, the daytime would keep them cool. And during the nighttime would keep them warm. The fire would came out at night. The issue to me here is that they would learn something in the wilderness. They learned to obey God. And, and this is it. You want to follow the cloud or you want to stay behind? Your call. The cloud's moving tomorrow. We're moving tomorrow. So if you want to go, go. Or you can get mad, stay back, and pout, get upset, and say, I ain't going. I'm tired of going. I ain't going back to church. I ain't going to serve God. I'm going to stay right here. You stay right there and watch see what happens. You're going to burn up during the day, and you're going to freeze at night. Obedience says keep following him. Amen? They learned teamwork, always moving, camp. They were always having to break down. I was with a pastor yesterday after a wedding. And uh, I asked him, how's it going? He said, for five years, man, we, we, you know, we were in a building. Now we're in a school. We're having to break down and, and bring in and set up and then break it down and bring it set up. And I started laughing at him. I said, well, good. Because my life has been a part of a whole lot of churches, time in churches, where we have set up and broke down. and set up. But I'm going to tell you something. It did something to us. We learned teamwork by doing that. We could, tear, we could set things up quickly, and we could tear down things quickly. We could learn how to work it because we did it together. Many hands make light work. Hallelujah. So they had to learn how to do that. They learned the chain of command. Moses wore himself out. His father-in-law stepped up and said, Moses, unless you quit this, you, you need to figure out something. You need to give ministries or people over ministries or over groups of people and let them take care of the little problems. You just take Take care of the big stuff. If not, you're going to wear yourself out, and you're not going to be a good son-in-law to me. This was a chain of command. And this is one of the things I've strived to do in this church. Let me just say this about 2019. There are those of you that are over women's ministries in here. There are those of you, Miss Diana, you have your thing. And I just released you. I, I've never been in your meetings. I don't walk into them. I don't, I don't uh, fleece you. I don't ask you, what are you doing? I, 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 tr I oh, almost said a bad word. I have confidence in you. That you've not failed and you're doing the right thing. 
I do the same thing for our bikers and those that are, that are working with our children. You know, it's important. The, the, I, don't, I don't dictate to, uh, to our, our band up here what they got to sing, what they got to do. I can make suggestions, particularly if they ask. But I've learned how to back away and say, you know what? Why get involved in something that's going to pull me in and take all my time? Let me deal with my things and let the people deal with their things. Amen? This was a chain of command that they had to learn. They learned that they could do the impossible. And that was to see the Red Sea uh, opened up. They saw that. They learned that what, what that God would never leave them. Forty years of circling. The fire is still with them. The cloud is still with them. Manna is still there. Amen. They learned repentance. You know, after they, they rebelled, we've seen several times vipers bit them. The ground opened up. Amen. All these things took place. They learned how to turn back toward God. They learned that God was, uh, was holy. He was a holy of holies. They carried the Ark of the Covenant with him. They learned of God's glory. Fire on the mountain, Moses, the tablets, Ten Commandments. They learned that God was, you know, somebody told me uh, the other day, he said, you know that Moses was the first guy that downloaded something from a cloud. It's just amazing how all that's come back around, amen. They learned that God was a God of order, the tabernacle, everything in his place. They learned that they could trust God, amen, that he would rain down bread from heaven. Every morning they got up, and there was manna. The Scripture says, give me your, give me your shoe. I want your left shoe. He said, put it right here. Just set it right there. He said to them, uh, in the morning when the manna gets here, you get it every day, but you can't save it up. The word manna actually means what is it? They could take it. It was like tofu. You could take it and turn it into anything you put with it. It would taste like whatever that was. It was amazing food. But God did it for 40 years. This is why when they got over in, into the promised land, they had to learn how to cook. You understand something? They didn't know how to cook uh, venison. They didn't know how to cook beef. They didn't know how to make soup. They, they were eaten by... It, well, you talk about something that I could touch a politically button right now. There are times in life that other people and governments provide for you over and over and over and over and over and over. But then there comes a time when God says it's time for you to work. It's time for you to make it. It's time for you to do something about it. And so they stepped up and stepped out, and they had to learn how to provide for themselves. Listen, this was an amazing thing. Look at this next one. They learned that God would provide water, manna, dash. Yet the Lord says, during the 40 years that I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. Forty years. Hold this boot. Five years old. Got a hole in it. <laughs> I got boots in my house that I have resold three, four times. I've only had them 15, 20 years because I don't want to get rid of my boots. I love my boots. I've always loved my boots. I got zippers in them. When my foot was fused, I can still put my foot down inside of it. I love my boots. I can't imagine going 40 years, one pair of sandals. Some of you women, it drive you nuts. When you look at your husband and say, can I go get another pair of shoes? He said, baby, well, you've had them sandals 35 years. They ain't wore out yet. You're good. Every, every, their clothes, they didn't have a, a wardrobe. They, they, all they had was what they had on and probably one more pair, whatever. And it never wore out. This, it, to me, this is that, that miracles that you miss when you're reading the Word of God. Forty years, your sandals did not wear. You were marching for 40 years. Forty years, you were moving, and they never wore out. Your clothes never wore out. My goodness, but when you moved over in the promised land after the first year, you got a hole in the bottom of your shoe. That God, he's a miraculous God, isn't he? Amen. He can do some crazy things. And when I read this, I thought, this is amazing. And yet with all that, everybody say all that. They got discouraged. They got discouraged. They got their feelings hurt. But the people grew impatient, discouraged on the way. And they began to complain. Hold on a minute. Your shoes ain't wore out. Your clothes ain't wore out. God is providing for you every day food. He brings water out of a rock. And all of a sudden now you're impatient. you discouraged. you upset. You start talking against the preacher. You get mad at God. Because of the way. Listen, listen to me. The scripture says, discouragement, this discouragement came on the trail of great victories. You know, it's easier to become victorious than it is to stay victorious. 
It's, it's hard once, it, once you get there. That's why dynasties are so, so rare to see. It's so rare to see people keep on winning all the time. It's the same with God's people here. They aim their discouragement at the wrong thing. The leader, God, and their situation. They focused on their problems. Now, did, do, did we not just read that they passed by the Red Sea? Did you, do you not go back and reexamine your pictures every now and then? One of the great things that I get to do because of this wonderful media age, I go back, on, I just downloaded all my 2018 pictures onto my computer. And I would go through there and I would look at those pictures and I would take my phone out and take a picture of my computer. How many of y'all do that? Because I don't know how to send it back over here to my phone. So I just take a picture of it on my phone and then I'll send it to people. I saw your picture. This was, you know, maybe 10 years ago, 15, and I take a picture and I'll send it to my kids how they used to look, how they, when they used to like each other, stuff like that. Yeah. And I would send it to him, and it would remind me how wonderful God is. Uh, when I seen the pictures of the flood and what it did, Patsy, uh, I was in your home. I, I remember what the flood did to your house, and I was just there the other day, and I saw the how beautiful it is now. But if you don't go back and remember how bad it was, you don't appreciate what you've got. And they just passed the Red Sea. They remember. They have to remember this is where the miracle was. And if we don't remember where we came from, we're going to start getting just like these folks. We'll say, we, if you don't remember what God brought you out of, You'll start getting discouraged. You'll start getting upset. You'll start blaming the preacher. You'll blame God. You'll blame all type of situations instead of looking at realizing he is the problem solver. Remember that he loves you, that he's with us. He is helping us. He hadn't backed off from us. And, and I, I call it emotional intoxic intoxication. Emotional intoxication. It works both ways. Emotional can be on the, on the positive side, but it also works on the negative side. Where, where you get so em emotionally distressed and distraught, it, it, it takes over your life. Intoxication just simply means it takes over your life. Some of you, you're, you're really good people, but drunk, I wouldn't want to be around you. That's why I don't drink, because you wouldn't want to be around me. I mean, I'm serious. I know me. I'd be mean. I'd be belligerent. I would say things that I probably have never said to you. <clears throat> Whether true or not, <laughs> it'd just be up in my head, you know. Moses, and listen, the big picture, when you get this way, the big picture's lost. And judgment's put to sleep. Life becomes one of extremes. Moses struck the rock. Abraham went into Hagar. Elijah asked God to kill him. Jonah asked God to kill him. You realize that some of the greatest uh, men of God have once asked God to kill him? Kill me. I don't want to stay here any longer. I don't want to do this anymore. Sometimes you've got to give it a day. Just give it one more day. Jonah asked God to kill him. The great priest Van Gogh uh, committed suicide at 33. Noah got drunk. Great victory. You, you got your whole family rescued. And what are you going to do now, Noah? I'm going to get drunk. Esau sold his birthright for beans. Samson gave his secrets away. Peter went back to fishing. You know, the devil's best tool in his toolkit, it was advertised that the devil was going to put his tools up for sale. On the date of the sale, the tools were placed for public inspection, each tool being marked with its sale price. They were a treacherous lot of implements. Satan had for sale hatred, envy, jealousy, deceit, lying, pride, and so on. He laid apart from the rest was his harmless-looking tool, well-worn, priced very high. Someone asked, what is the name of that tool? Pointing to it. Satan said, that's the wedge of discouragement. Replying, why, why have you priced it so high? Satan said, because it is more useful to me than any other weapon I own. I can pry open and get inside a man or a woman's heart with that when I cannot get near them with my other tools. And once I get inside, I can make him or her do what I choose. It's badly worn because it is used up almost everyone uh, it's used on almost everyone since very few people know that it belongs to me. Discouragement, my friend, is another way of telling God that he doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, to loss of courage, to keep pressing on. They were discouraged. Erroneous theology says this. When God fails to live up to your theology, change your theology. That's erroneous. Have you seen how, how our world has shifted today? If God doesn't live up to what you want him to, just change your theology. It is your expectation 
that you're flawed and not God. So, listen, defeat is when our way impacts our faith. Victory is when our faith impacts our way. I, I saw this week, and not to, not to beat this thing to death, but it bothered me. I was watching a, a ball game, and it was an AT&T commercial. And here it pops on. They're funny. They're funny commercials. But it, when okay is not okay. Y'all seen that? And all of a sudden, there's a woman talking about babysitting these kids, and the men are homosexuals. And it says, when okay is not okay. And I'm looking at it and going, are we going to swallow this? We, it, this is not okay. But it's saying it's not okay for you to babysit our kids and not know their name. And I'm going, have we gone this far and nobody says anything? No, I mean, we, uh, we'll, we'll just shift our theology. We'll just change it over. My goodness, it, sin is sin. I know that. And whether you, whether you uh, 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 making love to your refrigerator that's sin. Hello. You know, I throw homosexual, you think that's the worst thing ever. No, no, no. Yeah, overeating can hurt you too. Amen. Gossip, criticism, disunity, all these things. Lust of any shape, fashion, form. Th those, are, those are painful. But yet when I see this on TV, it's like, are you, we, we just keep shoving it down people's throat. And guess what? People are swallowing it. They're taking it. The church is setting back. We don't know how to handle it. We, don't, we want to love, and we want to say that, and yet we, nobody wants to say it. But that's wrong. That is not okay. That's living below what God wants for you. He may not want that for you. It's Adam. Oh, I would leave it alone, Jerry. Stop, stop, stop. Let me say it again. Defeat is when our way impacts our faith. Victory is when our faith impacts our way. It's a two-sided coin. Amen. Let the word, here, listen, let the word of God come to you. Let me start closing here. Let the word come to you. You've missed something. Job 13, 15 says, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. Indeed, his way, th this will turn out for my deliverance. For no godless man would dare come before him. Uh, go, go to this next slide. Let me, let me mention. Many times it's not going to the word that changes things. It is waiting for the word to come to you. That doesn't happen unless you get it inside of you. So first, you've got to get in the Word. Understand that. Get in the Word. Read the Word. But, but it's like, well, I'm just going to go to the Bible and get the answer. Sometimes the Word of God comes to you. Though He slay me, I know that He still loves me. No matter what I'm going through, and there are times I move through life, and I realize that the Word of God comes alive in you. Greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. When you say that to yourself as much as I have, you remind yourself that God made you for a greater purpose. Amen. There's nothing out there greater than what you've got going on that, that, that can take you out. I, my, my friend, I can keep hitting, hitting the object, and I'm telling you that I'm forged out of better metal than that. I'm going to press through this thing. The message found him. He did not find the message. There are times in life all through Scripture, David, Abraham, Moses, the Word of God found them, and it began to mold them and to shift them. And it happened also with the children of Israel. So you've got to learn to master discouragement. I encourage you to get in the Word of God. Stay in the Word so that there comes a time when it comes comes to you. Guard what's going on. Guard what is going out. Stay focused on the right things. Stay fo How do you keep them getting? Stay focused on the right. Look at something, my friend, that, that is true, that is noble, that is right, that's pure, that is lovely, that is admirable, uh, that those things that are excellent and praiseworthy. Think on those things. Yeah. Stay. Everybody say stay. Stay. There is little difference between faith and faithfulness. Don't make changes while discouraged. Oh, you're discouraged you're going to talk against God and against Moses? Well, Scripture says that God sent snakes. There are a few things scarier than a viper. I'm not talking about a chicken snake. Those don't bother me. Six, seven-foot chicken snake don't bother me. He just run along the ground. But let something coil up and have that head back like that. Now, Jim, that right there scares me. And it, when God sent the vipers, they opened up the oven, there was a viper. They flipped open the sheet from their cover, there was a viper. They laid their head down, they heard the hissing under their pillow. After a while, they started crying out to God, enough. They reached in the diaper bag to get out a diaper for the baby, there was a viper. Biting, it. vipers were everywhere. It's the, the fear of all of it. And they came to God and said, Lord, God, please quit. Oh, we, we apologize. I never want to get into a place where I look around and say, man, look at the vipers. They're popping your people, God. Forgive us. Help us remember the Red Sea. Help us remember all the things that we've learned in the wilderness. Bring us back to this place. 
Amen. I want to be in a place where, listen, don't doubt in the dark. Well, God showed you in the light. You saw the Red Sea part. You've seen your shoes. Your shoes didn't wear out. Your clothes are still good. By the way, I know some of you, you've had your shoes for 40 years. Like my daddy. Yo, my, I buy my dad a shirt when I was in my 20s. I'm in my 50s. He still has that shirt. I go home. My mom ain't got rid of all my dad's stuff. He passed at 84. I look in the closet. There's them shirts I bought him. They never wore out. Of course, you never wore them. How do you get out of it? Think your way out. You're smarter than you look. Look at the one next to you. Say, you're smarter than you look. Think your way out. Think your way out of this thing. The scripture says when the prodigal came to his senses, he said, my father has it going on. The servants are doing better. I'm going to go back and repent. Think your way out. You know what he was actually saying? Don't doubt in the dark what God showed you in the light. He was in a dark place, and he remembered. Sing your way out. Do you understand the power of music? I love music. I love music. Man, I can kick on some music. I've been listening to a guy named Mike Ferris. God have mercy. Got a song about mercy. I just listen to it over and over. There's something about it. I listen to music. It, it does something. You got to sing your way out. Well, Pastor, I don't sing real good. You're not singing to us. You're singing to him. And you can get privately. You can have moments. But just sing. I get tickled. I hear people tell me this all the time. Well, I can't sing. But you hand them a microphone, they get anointed. <laughs> Some of y'all need to go over to one of them Toys R Us places and get you one of them little pink microphones. Yeah. Put it back there in your bedroom somewhere and kick that thing on and start singing. What's that song J.J. used to sing to me? Let it go. Let it go. J.J. said, my granddaughter, Cassie, come over. Sing, Cassie. She couldn't sing. Hand her a microphone. Let it go. Let it go. And she run around the house singing that song. I don't even know what movie that was on. I'm sure it was a Walt Disney show. Frozen, y'all were saying. It was on a Frozen show. Let it go. But she knows that mic touched her hand. Sing your way out. Paul and Silas did. Heaven heard them. They praised. They gave God praise. Sometimes you're discouraged. You're going to have to learn to sing. You're going to have to open your mouth and let it out. Don't doubt in the dark, but God showed you the light. Faith your way out. Three Hebrew boys said, I know God's able to deliver. Remember your faith. It's not about my feelings. They were going by their feelings, and their feelings were getting them in trouble. My faith says that Red Sea parted. My faith says God has been here for me over and over and over again. Stand with me. Talk your way out. Some of you are so good at talking. I have an anointing for it. I've talked my way out of more tickets. I'm not here boasting online. I want to thank you for allowing me those opportunities. But you got to talk your way out. Sometimes you get yourself in a situation, you just got to talk. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. His family had been taken away by the Philistines because the, the souls of all the people was grieved, and every man and his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. And I'm not talking about talking to people. I'm just talking about talking to yourself. Talk to yourself. You can do this thing. You can make this happen. You can work this out. He turned and encouraged himself. I'm going to tell you, there's going to be time you're not going to get me on the phone. You may be distant even away from me. You say, well, Pastor, my, and I hear this a lot, and I love you. My encouragement, Pat, you encourage me. I appreciate that. But there's a time you're not going to get a preacher. You're not going to find, you're not going to find a friend. The phone ain't going to work. Text messages aren't going to come back quick enough. And you're going to have to encourage yourself. You're going to have to say to yourself, Self, we can do this thing. We ain't got to be stupid at this moment. We can make it through this. Amen. I'm not going to be discouraged. I know the part. I know the Red Sea parted. I know the power of God. My shoes. He provides for me. He's Jehovah Jireh. I know so. He's healed me. I don't care if you got the sniffles right now. Remember a time God healed you. 
healed your kids. Don't doubt in the dark, but God has showed you in the light. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over your people. We're coming through the wilderness or we out of it. But either way, you're forging us. You're making us. You're building us. Uh, my heart is so toward those that are discouraged. Oh, open, open your eyes just for a minute. Look at me. Let me just straight up with you. Do you know what encourages me? This right here. My fear, H, is that God would ever take this away from me. And you've got a pulpit in your life, and you're afraid that one day it's going to be taken away from you. And if it's taken away from you, are you going to be able to stand? And then, Miss Diane, that's my heart. God, can I stand if I ain't preaching again? If I never preach your word again, can I be like what I've preached two people to be? Cheryl, that I would keep serving God. That this doesn't become an idol. That nothing in my life stands between me and him. That I, I'm able to stand but this does, encourages me. I'm encouraged when I see you. But what if God takes you out of my life? Will I keep standing? And you've got to get to a place like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Whether he delivers me or not, I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to give up. I've, I've been, I know I've been forced. I know I've been hit. I know I've been heated. I know I've been anointed. I know those things in my life. So I, I'm, I'm not going to back away from that. I will keep pressing into that. And no matter if I'm behind the pulpit or in a church, because I've been without it before. But I remember how, how, you know what I did? I sought him more than I ever had before. And when you get it back, you, you can't get to a place where you go, well, I got it back now. No, no, I got to keep seeking him. I need him more, more than I've ever needed him before. Amen. As I get older, I need him more. Mike, we need him more. Because we're all in the wilderness of some sort, fashion, or form. So as we press into 2019, be prayerful, be relational, be sacrificial, be worshipful. Allow your life to become, you got one more year. Robert, I appreciate talking to you the other day on the phone because you, you said some things that just spoke in my spirit. We have so much time here. We, we don't know what can be taken away, but I don't want to just sit here. I want to press in. I want my life to be more than just that pulpit. I don't want to just be your pastor. I want to be your friend. Be your brother. So, Lord, I speak over your people. I say to them this year, not going to be like any other year to them. But, Lord, there's going to be some things that are going to happen. We're going to see that the fortune that took place in 2018 is going to carry us through 2019. That the beatings we took, the heat we went through, the oil we were put in was preparing us for something you had prepared for us. That you were setting us up, setting us up for something. So I'm looking, not God, for a year that's going to challenge, a year that's going to uh, do something in our life. We're going to look back. And we're going to remember the Red Sea crossings. We're going to remember that there were vipers at times, but you protected us. We cry out to you. Give us strength. Help us be the people of God you've called us to be, not settle for the minimum. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. seated for a brief minute i uh up here to my left and right are little buckets inside of them a little oil david you could prepare to come up with the with those things and our servant leaders are coming up but listen we, tuesday night we're going to have a, a anointing service we're going to anoint ourselves with oil as the scripture teaches us and we're going to start fasting now you don't have to fast and so i think in a cool way we're doing this on tuesday and wednesday but we're going to offer this to you and it's just a little bit of oil that we have, and one per family. And you can anoint yourself this week. You may have already started fasting. But when we fast, we're going to explain it a little bit deeper on Tuesday and Wednesday, giving up something in order for something else to be added to our life. Uh, Jesus said certain things only came out through prayer and fasting. We live to eat. Don't we? You already know it's your Sunday. You know where you're going to eat. You know what's been happening in your life. You know, you're thinking about Cracker Barrel or, you know, something of that nature. We live, we, we, we live to eat. We love it. But, but in Christ's time, they ate to live. You didn't have refrigeration 
you had to fish, and if you caught a fish that day, you ate. If you didn't, you didn't. You ate bread. If you're fortunate, if you had fish and bread. So in our day, we're so blessed. Gasoline at a buck seventy-seven a gallon. Ramirez was just in Mexico, four dollars a gallon in Mexico. Yeah. We up here in America, enjoying two buck. God is good. Amen. Amen. Saving money, good things are happening. Amen. God is so good. But here's the thing. <laughs> so now I got to tell you that you got to make this happen. It ain't one of these things. You say, well, I ain't got no food anyway. No, we all got food. If you ain't, you know where to get it. Amen. But to fast means to set aside food or a drink or 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 uh, media, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, something that you've been on that you want to give up or, or take some time off from. You don't have to totally. You can decide. I want to give it up for a for a, a three days. I'm, we're going on 21 days. We're going to start on on Tuesday and take it to the end of the month. And uh, you know, I like the Daniel fast. I'll just say it to you real briefly. It's soup, salad, and cereal. But it ain't about, hey, pastor, what are you not eating? It's what I am eating. Soup. It's just easier for me to remember. Soup, salad, cereal. Amen. And then so everything else is excluded off the list, unless you can figure out how to get it in the pot. All right. Yeah, I've I've gone without uh, meat. I've I've done 21 days without meat. Uh, I've done. 21, you can do 21 days without, but set some, but here's the thing, you're praying more, you're more sensitive, a lot of times it's what we've ate and what we've intaked that, that's clouded our minds, amen, but, but to learn how, and you can be, you'll be amazed that in three weeks, what kind of addictions fall, what breaks, what, what you get, uh, get through, whether it be nicotine, caffeine, uh, um, what's some more teens, <laughs> You know, you know what I'm saying, Amen. You can get, you can get through. It's, so it's, it's really, it's not, a, it's, it's not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, when you get sick, your body starts fasting. You get sick enough, your body is shut down. So that's enough. Can't take it no more. You shove one more ice cream, one more donut in here. I'm going to re revolt against you, Amen. So if you're not going to be able to be here Tuesday night, pick up one of these tonight or today before you leave. And anoint yourself and say, this is what I want to do. Now, here's the next thing. Get you a partner. Get somebody to join with you. Get somebody to say, you know, I want to do this. I need a little help. Don't beat me up. The Scripture says that some of you started slapping one another because you were fasting. Fasting is not a way to reason to start slapping one another. <laughs> I've often said, if you're that way, eat a Snickers because you ain't you when you're hungry. You know, so you got to learn how to manage that. Amen. Some of you may have talked to your doctors, you know. Sometimes, sometimes you got to have a little doctor input if, you, if you're struggling with diabetes or something. But who knows? You may end up getting, uh, becoming drug-free at the end of this month. Amen? If you need to tie their offer an envelope, amen, to, to give, to sacrifice, to believe God, you may lift your hand or servant leaders will make their way to you. Amen. And, and another thing, you know, one of the reasons pastor does 21 days is uh, 21 days to make a new habit. And so yeah. we hope to make good habits right. and get rid of old bad habits. Yeah. Uh, some of the habits we have, they, they form easily. And the Bible says little foxes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a little thing when it starts. And my wife one day, she, she said, uh, I was telling her that caffeine was a drug. And she said, drug? And I said, well, that's what they consider. And she goes, David, I think you're addicted. I said, duh. Yeah. <laughs> duh. Uh, so that's well. just a little thing in my life, you know. But, you know, it's, it's the little things. If we're not careful, we allow a small thing to become a big thing. So uh, fasting is going to be a good time for this church, I believe, this year. January 6th, today is Tayden's Pantry, the clothing ministry at the other campus. It's going to be open. If you guys need some food or clothes, um, it's always open on the first Sunday. Uh, January 6th as well, today. Uh, Zion's Lion after the second service from New Caney if you, if you didn't know and you're here and you want to ride you just want to go for a drive uh, after your second service they're going to be taken off for fun fellowship and food because uh, that's what we do in church <laughs> huh and, well yeah and then we just have to enjoy the food that we eat you can still enjoy salad I guess <laughs> 
January 6th, TLCC office, change of address request. Listen, in the back, um, the office said, look, if you have changed your address and you want to get a, a tithe uh, in the mail, you got to let us know. Otherwise, yeah, if you exactly. If you want to get anything from us, if we don't have your address, believe it or not, it's not going to get there. So uh, check that out in the back. I believe we have cards already fixed. I think it just says change of address. If they're not on that table, they're on the table right in the hall, okay? Um, Lift, ladies' Bible study. That's Miss Diane. Um, after service and fellowship today, as well as the third Sunday. See Miss Diane Phelan. Uh, now, 2019 ministry leaders, turn in your calendar uh, of events to Sister Lori for accurate and timely announcements. Thank you. Uh, January 7th, we got your six tomorrow night in New Caney. Anybody that's ever been in the armed forces, come and see them. Uh, they have, they just have really, really good resources for you. Sometimes you don't know that you don't know until you find out. So uh, they have some good resources. If you ever need anything, uh, they, they have some really, really good resources for you. Uh, January 8th through the 31st, we are doing our corporate fast. Again, it's 21 days. Uh, and, and it seems like a long time when you feel like you're giving up something, but it's worth it in the end. Yeah. If you really spend the time, again, let's not be mediocre in it. Let's not just do just an, okay, well, the church is fast. I guess I got I to gotta give up something. But if you really do it right and you say, Lord, I just want to seek you. It's not about what I'm giving up. It's about what I'm finding. And if you do it that way, I promise you, you will see results from this. Amen. Today we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Amen. Well, just so you guys know, I wasn't actually in vacation for three weeks. <laughs> I was only in Mexico for about 10 days. I was sick that first week, and then the second I was in Mexico, and then the third I didn't make it in time for Sunday. I got back Monday. But I missed you all. So it's good It's good to be back, and I hope you guys had a great Christmas and a good New Year with family. And I just remembered, man, I'm just happy to be back here with my family, you guys. And so let's go ahead and worship him a little bit this morning. <laughs> And times I fail till your mercy remains. Should I stumble again? Still I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all things. Your will above all. My purpose remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. My heart and my soul. I give you control, consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out, everlasting. Your light will shine with.
Lord, my soul cries out, cry out to you. You are worth it, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. All right. Thank you, brother. It is good to have you back. Let's pray it. Get this 2019 going. Father God, we do give you thanks for last year and for this upcoming year, Father God. Yes, quite a few of us got knocked down, but by golly, with your help, we got back up again, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you for being our rock, our strength, and surely our song, Father God. May we sing your praises throughout the world in the upcoming days. Thank you so much for looking out for us. And until we meet again, Jesus, we love you so much. It's your precious name we pray. Amen.